Hello, listeners. Welcome to another episode of Cognitive Dissidents. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Joining me after a brief hiatus on the show is Marco Papich, cousin Marco, as he is affectionately known here. He is a partner and chief strategist at Clock Tower Group. We used to work together at Stratfor back when it was Stratfor in the day. It's rain now. Um, we've, we've, he's been traveling, I've been traveling, our schedules have been crazy, but we had to get together to talk about geopolitics and also to give you your NBA basketball preview. If you don't want to listen to the basketball part, it kicks in at about the hour mark or hour and five minute mark and you can turn off then, but we're brilliant. So I don't know why you wouldn't want to listen. Um, let's just, we talk about American politics in this podcast a little bit. So I just want to get ahead of comments that are inevitably going to come because no matter what you do, they're going to come anyway. Um, I, I have political opinions. This is not the place for them. I try not to talk about my political opinions opinions here. Also, Cognitive Investments is a wealth management firm. To the extent that I have biases, it's about whether our trades and our strategies are working and whether they're making money for our clients. And, uh, you know, my money is with us as well here. So if if I have a bias, it's about that. Um, If you detect any bias from me about what I think about which U.S., who should be U.S. president, this, that, or the other thing, uh, I have nothing to say about this and this. uh, I have nothing to say about that in this podcast or in podcasts in general. You'll have to get to know me and buy me a beer if you want to hear my opinions. But this is not the place for that. If you detect any of that, that's not what's going on. We're trying to talk objectively about what's going on with politics, what's going on in the world, how to understand it. If you want the partisan take, there are plenty of other podcasts out there, even podcasts run by last people whose name is Shapiro, who will give you the partisan take if you want. That's not what we're here to do. We're just trying to talk about what is and what isn't, and we do the best we can to do that. So with that out of the way, if you want to talk about wealth management or the research and consulting services that we offer, or you just want to give me suggestions for who to come on the podcast or what books to read, it's jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers and see you out there. You know, we've got a we've got a bunch of stuff to talk about. Why don't we Why don't we just take a step back here? Because I'm curious how you would answer this question. Because I, I got asked it yesterday, and I've been so down in the weeds doing a research report. I know you just finished your monthly. Um, if somebody came up to you and said, "What is the most important thing happening in the world geopolitically?" Just or pure geopolitics. We can get to markets later. But what what is the thing that is going to matter 12 months from now that either people are talking about or not talking about? What's your answer to that question here today on October the fourth? I mean, it really, I think, has to be the U.S. election. Yeah. I mean, but I'm open. I'm open to other answers. What, what do you think it is? I, I've been I've been struggling with that answer because you know the instinct is to say the Russia Ukraine war, and I don't want to. I don't want to get used to the Russian Ukraine war and just say, well, because it's been happening for two years now, and there's no end in sight that it's not important. Um, you know, China is sitting there also important, but I don't know. It's, it, it is hard to sort of make any other case. It's, it's funny you say that. Cause, um, I still remember, I don't know if you remember you and I, uh, did a podcast immediately after January 6th and I was upset about January 6th and you were like, don't worry about it. It's fine. And I, I'm over here talking about stab in the back and you're like, no, this is like nonsense. Nothing is going to happen. Um, and I, I don't know, like it's, uh, it, it is strange. I, I can't explain Trump's continued resilience in the polls despite all the allegations against him and listeners i i don't care i'm not like my politics is not here i don't care one way or another but like it's just interesting to me that a dude with four indictments can continue to ascend in the polls it's also just at a time of such dislocation in the world like the united states is just you're completely unstable like we are not a stable actor in the world right now and you can say that from you know speaker mccarthy got kicked out today. I didn't know that that was the first time a speaker had ever been evicted from the position in yeah, the history of the Republic. That's right. like me wild. But like, how are we supposed to make policy if we're, you know, if the speaker can't even, you know, fund the government at a basic level? And again, I know there's politics. I don't want to get into the politics of it, but it's just from the point of view of you look around the world and the countries that are, say, Brazil, you know, installing much needed tax reform, uh, Mexico, increasing the state's role of, uh, in the economy, whether it's energy and agriculture, might be the wrong thing to do, but they're making policy and they're doing things. Whereas here in the US, like we're not, we're, we're passing inflation reduction acts that have nothing to do with inflation. We have a migration problem <laughs> and we go to the border and say hello and that's it. We have a Republican debate without the main candidate there. He's visiting a Detroit auto worker shop. So um, I, I guess I do take your point. But so what what are the scenarios then? Like, what do you think is going to happen in the US election? Are, are you brave enough to go there? <laughs> well, uh, you know, uh, first of all, I will just say this, um, from a purely professional perspective, I 150% want Trump to win. <laughs> I was trying to get you to spit your coffee, but come on, 
You, you got to be in the same boat. <laughs> I, was, I was close. This is this is Papa Trump. You know, like he's going to build you uh, like a summer cabin somewhere. Uh, although you live in New Orleans, so maybe a winter cabin. You'll get something <laughs> in the mountains. Next four years will be incredible. You'll have clients, especially international clients, just clamoring for your services. So, um, you know, like Don is great for geopolitical strategists. So I'll just say that as the first thing. I mean, in terms of scenarios, you and I, of course, come, uh, we started work together. Um, you're a little bit younger than me, but you basically a couple of years behind me at Stratfor. Um, and uh, we were schooled in the same philosophy, which is that, you know, domestic politics kind of doesn't matter. Yep. What matters is two oceans, the Mississippi River, what matters is the timelessness of geopolitical imperatives. The, the the Mississippi River, by the way, which is drying up and which we have saltwater intrusion coming for New Orleans. So that's also flashing red if you want to. Do. Because geography never changes, <laughs> right? Mediterranean was once the center of the earth, as the name says. But anyways, we digress. The point is that um, I, I respect that school, obviously. And, and um, I, I remember when, you know, uh, George Friedman, for example, who we both worked for, um, made a very bold statement ahead of the 2008 election, or maybe right afterwards, mm -hmm. uh, saying like, look, Obama, McCain, who cares? It's the same thing. And I remember how many clients and readers of the service, like their brains blew up, you know? And I, and I really relish that as a nihilist, as somebody who truly doesn't care, who's bathed in aloof indifference. Mm -hmm. I really love that approach. However, there are moments in time when domestic politics does matter, where you do have these inflections which are really just a manifestation of a continued uh, buildup of anomalies uh, that signify a paradigm shift in sort of a Kuhnian sense. Mm -hmm. And what's happening right now in the US is that kind of a moment. And I think that, um, you know, Donald Trump coming back to the presidency would see a 180 degree shift on potentially several different issues. I mean, Ukraine Russia war is the one that everybody always cites, and that's fine. You know, I don't really disagree. That is the most obvious potential shift. A uh, relationship with allies, which the Biden administration has made a point to rebuild, mm -hmm. could be another one. But really, really, <clears throat> you know, liberals liberals just accuse Donald Trump of being pro-Russian, and that's why that would happen. But I think that's a very, very, um, you know, politically charged accusation. I think a much deeper and thoughtful issue is that there is a, a very isolationist streak in U.S. Um, thinking, ideology, culture, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and it manifests itself at times of internal strife and economic uh, dislocation. And so we saw that with, for example, Nixon closing the gold window, the Nixon shock, which was also complemented with tariffs on all imports um, and negotiations to depreciate the dollar that you know resulted in the Smithsonian Agreement. And I think something similar, a 180-degree turn, a true break with globalization could be the consequence of a Trump presidency. And, and I mean, look, Biden administration is nibbling at that as well. I mean, there's a lot of engagement with allies. There's a lot of engagement with the global south. But then National Security Advisor Sullivan gives a speech at the Brookings Institute um, earlier this year where he basically talks about a foreign policy for the middle class, which honestly is the same verbiage, I mean, sorry, same themes as Donald Trump's policies, just sanitized for the CFR crowd so they don't spit up their wine yeah. uh, before the event, yeah. you know, at the, at the reception. It's the exact same. That speech is basically Trump's foreign policy. It's basically anti-globalization rhetoric. It's like China's fault for everything that's happening in this country. It's not our fault. Oh, no, we shouldn't pass any legislation, to your point. We shouldn't, we shouldn't try to figure out how to improve the middle class you know, quality of life. No, 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 no. It's all China's fault. And therefore we will have a foreign policy for the middle class. And I'm sitting there like, what about domestic policy for the middle class? You know, maybe you should have like focused on that. The Biden administration abandoned it. They didn't even really try to engage the Republicans. If you want to talk about the failures of the Biden administration, I think it will be that the gap between how they ran the primary, how they ran the White House is massive. Mm -hmm. During the primary, Biden and his team were very, um, resistant to the call that all Republicans are evil. Remember, they got into trouble because he said he would work with Republicans, which, like, of course he would. Why wouldn't he? 
But once he got into the White House, none of that domestic agenda really got passed. Obviously, to his credit, Republicans were obstructionists, but there were issues, like you mentioned, immigration, where they could have found a common ground. None of that happened. And so the Democratic Party basically has decided to uh, to adopt the same rhetoric as Republicans in terms of you know globalization and, and trade, uh, mercantilism, IRA, Inflation Reduction Act is extremely protectionist on many levels. And so I think that a Trump 2.0 presidency could just say like, let's continue this trend, but in a more dramatic way and rip completely the US from a globalized you know, trade and geopolitical system. So that's where I would say that this election does matter. Yeah. Previous moments like this in American history, so you already alluded to Nixon and the end of the 70s into Reagan. You know, I would the 1920s into Roosevelt is one of these periods. The Civil War is also one of these periods. The thing that has been confusing to me about this, and I think you're right to invoke um, the word paradigm and Thomas Kuhn in this in this context. But in each of those three previous scenarios where something like this has happened in U.S. politics, the economy sucked. Like it was stagflation yeah. in the 70s. It was the Great Depression in the 1920s. 1850s and 60s was slavery, but also the Southern economy versus the Northern economy and you know industrialization and the pains of all these things and a Southern agrarian economy that just didn't work in the industrializing world that was continuing. Um, I don't know how to, like that's not happening. The US economy doesn't suck at all. You've been on this podcast and writing for a long time. We're at the beginning of a CapEx cycle. Like the government is loading up, companies are loading up. Everybody said there was gonna be a recession. You and I were both optimistic there wasn't gonna be a recession and that things have been going okay. And we, even the concerns about inflation, the US consumer is showing, you know, I have plenty more to spend. I have plenty more appetite and demand for things than the experts are really letting on. So I don't yeah. know, how, how do you account for that discrepancy? Because I, I was sort of expecting this kind of shift at some point in the next couple of years, but I thought that it would happen with economic catastrophe. And it's ha the, yeah. the confusing thing is it's happening in, in a time of relative prosperity. And this is why the, the inability to make domestic policy is so bad, because if you just had basic competency in domestic policy, the economy would probably be off to the races. Like the United States government is holding the economy back with all of this nonsense rather than pushing it forward. Well, I think the first point that comes out of your uh, statement is just what would happen if the economy wasn't doing well. So, you know, if a, if a recession is coming, like look up in terms of politics. The other thing I would say is that, you know, Donald Trump was elected with unemployment, don't quote me, although this is going into the internet. <laughs> I think the unemployment was like 4.7% when he was elected in 2016, maybe 5% or something. It wasn't, it wasn't nine. You know, um, we were eight years into a recovery when Donald Trump was elected. And so um, I know the economy wasn't as strong then. It was the jobless recovery, the, the capexless recovery, it was secular stagnation. But you could have made the same point, like, why is the American median voter unhappy? Today's a very similar situation, um, except the economy is doing even better. Um, excess savings running out. Uh, it's one of my pet peeves. I think it's a ridiculous argument. People who do that are just like way too enamored with mathematical modeling and they're not thinking about psychology. American uh, households are not going to go back to their previous level of savings. But one of the reasons, Jacob, they're not is because there's nothing to save for. Hmm. Because all of the middle class goods that you want are basically unaffordable if you're middle class. Childcare. Healthcare, like good healthcare, not crappy healthcare. Um, education for your kids, like tertiary education in particular, like forget about it. And then finally, homes. So over the and, and that's why the obsession with CPI. Whenever some like rich finance guy, rich finance bro, tells me, Marco, you don't know, you live in Santa Monica, you're too rich. CPI hurts poor people. I'm like, bro. First of all, I lived through hyperinflation in Serbia, so like let's leave that aside. <laughs> Second of all. Second of all, uh, CPI is irrelevant. Okay, no one's walking around in the United States of America not being able to like, you know, feed themselves because tomatoes are not three but four dollars. Forget it. That's not that's irrelevant. CPI being at five percent is not why people are angry. People are angry because over the last thirty years, the price of middle class goods, which almost none of them are in the CPI by the way, have been on this inexorable rise. Yeah. And so I would say that that's why people are uh, still angst-filled. I mean, Biden and Trump are neck and neck in the polls. Trump has about a 4% disadvantage in terms of like polling. So he's really ahead of the polls. 
by about, I would say, 3 to 5%. And I think that that's not a reflection of how popular he is, because he's not. It's not a reflection of how unpopular Biden is in particular. I think it's just any incumbent would be polling at this very low level. And it's because of this built-in angst over the last 40 years where middle-class goods go up in price, but middle-class you know, wages don't. Now, we've had a good two years in terms of wage growth, and the stimulus is still on household balance sheets of many Americans, but it's just not enough, and certainly not enough for you to put a down payment to the home um, or think about your kids going to college. So what makes Americans middle class has become di- more difficult to attain, and that's that hasn't changed over the last three years. Uh, before we leave the United States, just the last thing to say here, I mean, you talked about the isolationist streak in the United States. I, I think the other thing about either a tr- honestly this is true in either scenario it has different forms of it i mean the, the trump administration was very unpredictable and you're right that in some ways it's good for geopolitical strategists when you have someone like trump in office in some ways though our models don't work because the dude can wake up on the wrong side of the bed and decide i'm going to send a letter to kim jong un and sort of mess everything up in your beautiful geopolitical model um the other the other part of this is that you know whether it's biden or trump biden is 80 trump is 77 these are old guys. Like I, I hope that they are healthy and I hope that they live uh, for as long as they're in office. But like, it's not hard to imagine one of them, whichever one of them wins, having a health problem in office. And then are you dealing with President Harris or President whoever gets, you know, sort of the runner up position Vivek. to Trump there too? Oh, you think it's going to be Vivek? Yeah, great. I don't know. I don't know. Did you, uh, I, I saw, I, I've watched some of the Republican debate and I saw Nikki Haley say that, uh, did you see the thing she said? She was like, Vivek, every time you open your mouth, I, f- I feel like I get a little bit dumber. It was, it was uh, I, I, I love watching uh, both sides tear each other apart in the debates. Anyway, let, let's move away from the United States. We've already done more on it than I thought we were going to do. Um, the Probably the title of the podcast will be the era of score settling, which you brought up when we were sort of planning uh, some of the content here. And I think this is maybe something that is underappreciated uh, in general. This is, again, more pure geopolitics. And you you said when we were talking before we hit the record button, you didn't think there were huge financial and investment implications. I'm, I'm not actually so sure about that. So maybe we can get into that a little bit. Um, but wh- why don't you set the table for what you mean by the era of score settling and we can hack into it from there. So, you know, like uh, I think we both agree um, fervently that the world is multipolar and that, uh, you know, there's consequences to that kind of a world. Um, in a unipolar world, you're not allowed to do anything that the hegemon doesn't allow you to do. Uh, if you do, you get, you know, like immediately, um, you know, um, reprimand. So, um, that was a very clear in 1999, for example, where my homeland Serbia was bombed by NATO. It's like, oh, you think you're going to, um, you know, do something in Kosovo, you can't, you're not allowed. We didn't authorize that. Something happens to you. Um, in a bipolar world, there's more maybe room to maneuver, but it has to be sanctioned by the two superpowers, by the two most powerful countries in the world. Um, when that doesn't happen, for example, when when there's intra-alliance fights like Turkey versus Greece over Cyprus, it's settled by one of the superpowers. Hey guys, there's bigger issues here at play in Cyprus. You know, we have to keep our eye on the ball, which is the Soviet Union. You're not allowed to have a war. Uh, and then finally, in a multipolar world, this doesn't happen. So there's this, uh, there's two things that happen. First of all, regional powers get to do kind of what they want. And Turkey is a really good example. They invaded Syria. Um, they've repeatedly invaded Iraq, um, you know, like obviously just to deal with the Kurds. But still, um, that's, that's kind of par for the course. Everybody knows that. Like, okay, regional hegemons have a little bit more elbow room uh, in a multipolar world. But what I think is really interesting is this score settling between um, not even regional hegemons, you know, just like minnows, like just tiny little Lilliputian countries that most people just really don't care about. Uh, we already had a war between Azerbaijan and Armenia in 2000. And of course, we saw what happened um, a couple of weeks ago where Azerbaijan basically um, reinvaded Nagorno Karabakh, what was left in Armenian controls, and has essentially sanctioned ethnic cleansing of Armenians out of the Gono Karabakh. So that's that's one example. The other example are the tensions between Serbia and Kosovo, um, which have bubbled up over the last couple of weeks as well. Um, and there was even like, you know, border disputes in 2022 that nobody really watched uh, between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. We don't, mm-hmm. we don't have to get into it, but like, you know, these are things that are happening. Nobody's really paying attention because India, China having a fist fight in the Himalayas is much more intriguing. 
But to me, it's also more predictable. It's more obvious. Um, what's not less obvious are these smaller conflicts. And I think that we're likely going to have a lot of them um, in the world that we're in right now. And it's also, by the way, a marker of multipolarity that they are happy. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. And and I think you can, if you sort of widen the aperture of your lens a little bit, I mean, not everything has to be, you know, Eurasian countries, uh, you know, attacking each other for, for, um, for land that wasn't claimed before. Like, you can go to Argentina and Paraguay are in a big spat right now, because Argentina decided that they were going to impose a poll on the Piranha River. And Paraguay said, no, you can't do that. And Argentina's like, well, then we're not letting the ships go through. And so now you've got you know, Mercosur is, is falling apart and Brazil is trying to push Argentina to go back. But then Lula and Fernandez also have some kind of, you know, ideological affinity there. Um, you mentioned India, like Kashmir fits into this. They're settling scores in Kashmir. They just wiped out a couple of years ago. Kashmir's status as a special zone. China did this with Hong Kong, too. So it's kind of there in general. Um I wonder, I, I don't have any evidence for this, but I was wondering about Azerbaijan. You think Azerbaijan settled that score itself, or do you think that Turkey was looking at Russia and A, seeing Russian weakness, and B, was mad at Russia for leaving the Black Sea Grain Initiative and basically embarrassing Erdogan at every turn? Because, you know, Erdogan would say, Black Sea Grain Initiative, almost back. And then Putin would say, nope. And then Erdogan, no, no, I talked to Vladimir. He wants it back. Nope. Uh, I, I kind of wonder if Turkey wasn't wasn't egging Azerbaijan there. And then that that makes me wonder if the Balkans thing is connected, whether Russia is now talking to Serbia or I don't know. It's 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 all kind of conjoined in my head. Do you think there's anything to that or do you really think it is just kind of local warlords deciding to take on the map what they think is there? You know, well, well, having <laughs> having been born in a, in a very small country that nonetheless managed to somehow start World War I, <laughs> I tend to give agency to very small countries, you know, so obviously I, I do think your point about Turkey's role is important, but I, I think Azerbaijan has been a very smart um, planner, and uh, I think what they've done is uh, really interesting, and, I, and I, I don't mean to condone or give a moral normative sense. People who know me know that I have no morality or normative lens at all, um, so just want to emphasize that. Um, I think they've just been very smart in waiting. They realized they had natural resources. They allowed a buildup of capital over 20 years, build up their military, and they waited for their moment. And they they used uh, the COVID pandemic as a moment to really launch a war. And now I think they're using this weakness in Russia. <laughs> so I don't know to, to what extent they needed any egging from Turkey. You know, And now the risk is that Turkey and Azerbaijan are going to connect Azerbaijan and Turkey. That's the next real question. And the question... Uh, that a friend of mine posed, a really good friend of mine who happens to be Armenian, he just asked me, uh, Marco, do you believe that norms of territorial integrity have been eroded, you know, in the world? And I kind of laughed, like, obviously. But he's like, no, 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 but uh, obviously, like, Russia invading Ukraine, got it. Like, big countries bullying small countries. That's not new. What about small and small? And, and I thought to myself, well, small and small violence is no difference from like big against small. It's more about, is someone going to do something about it? And that has to do with the fact that in a multipolar world, it's difficult. It's difficult for the US to kind of intervene all the way the, in the Caucasus, um, unless one of their allies, like Turkey, acts responsibly to uphold some sort of a norm. And once that chain breaks down, you know, yeah, you can have small and small violence. Like if, if Serbia were to invade Kosovo, um, I think I think NATO could definitely prevent it. I think a lot of people misjudge the size of the militaries involved. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking like single digit thousands, not tens of thousands of troops. Uh, and there's no appetite for like mobilization in a country that's as war weary as Serbia. Um, so I do think that NATO could prevent this. But at the same time, you know, Western commitment to like coastal integrity could have been eroded by the Trump administration, by the way. They actually suggested a land deal between Serbia and Kosovo, and um, and I think Albania as well. So, like you know, there's there's all sorts of things that are breaking down that create an opportunity uh, for a lot of small conflicts um, to bubble up. Well, yeah, and, and we don't even have to go to Trump for that. I mean, both the Biden White House and the EU have been much weaker in their support of Kosovo over the last couple of months than any time I don't know since NATO went into Serbia. I mean, it's no. It, I in ever yeah well and, and i mean look objectively speaking <clears throat> i think that's because you know kosovo has been intransigent itself in applying some of the agreements that were 
made before. There's this analogy that keeps being made that if you give autonomy to the Serbs in the north of Kosovo, you'll have a Repub- Republic of Serbsk. Mm-hmm. You know, you hear that a lot in the media. And I'm sitting there saying like, and that is a problem because, I mean, I understand that the president of Republic of Serbska, Dodik, is like a pro-Russian guy that the West doesn't like, definitely not a liberal. I get that. But when was the second Bosnian civil war? Oh yeah, that's right. We haven't had it. Because the Dayton Accord, you know, it, it made an ineffective country. I understand that. And I, I appreciate the criticism of both the accords and of the entity that exists, Republic of Serbska, especially if you're like Bosnian Muslim, you definitely have the right to to be extremely uh, opposed to this entity. But from a perspective of international peace and order, the American solution to this problem was effective. We haven't had another war. And so if uh, if Northern Kosovo became another quote-unquote Republic of Srpska, like, you know, again, I sympathize with the Albanian position, but from a global perspective, like, tough. Yeah. You know, it is a solution to, to this issue, so you need to you need to implement. And that's yeah. why you had this, like, loss of patience by the West, I think, in this issue. Uh, but, of course, why is then Serbia pushing it to a, to a break of conflict? That's the question I have. And, and the only way to answer that, Jacob, and I, and I want to know what you think about this, is that in this context, in this multipolar world, you get paid by kind of being an asshole. You know, if you're just compliant and just doing whatever um, the powerful countries want, nobody pays attention to you. The only way to kind of elbow your way into some attention is to actually create risk and to create trouble. And so all these countries have like a moment when the West is distracted by Ukraine, when NATO is focused over there, and if you start throwing some spitballs from the back of the class, like the teacher has to pay attention to you and give you some of that attention. And so uh, perhaps there is a rational explanation for what Belgrade is doing. Um, at least I hope that there is one and that that's actually what Serbia is doing. And that it's not really an attempt to reconquer the region because I think that will probably fail. I, I guess so. I mean, the, that leads nicely into one of the things I wanted to ask you, which is that because um, I, I think that the role of the European Union in all of this also matters because you, you talked about small on small conflict. The thing about small on small conflict is it usually doesn't stay there. Usually a bigger power in the region or a bigger fish is going to say, well, I can I can monkey this around to be in my interests as well. So sort of examples of this. I don't know if you saw this um, this week. France has sent a military attache to Armenia, and they announced just in the last couple of days that they're going to start sending arms to Armenia. So I sort of stopped in my chair and said, okay, like maybe French defense companies see an opportunity to send weapons and things like that. But that's that's how proxy conflicts start. We already had France on the other side of Turkey in Libya. Like, is this another sort of thing there? Is France thinking the South Caucasus needs to eventually get into the European Union? The part with Serbia, the thing that makes me think about the European Union from that point of view, Serbia tilting towards Russia over the last couple of decades, I think it's fair to say, uh, probably would love to be welcomed into the European Union. For the first time, I think in years, the European Union has real appetite. There's real agreement in both Berlin and Paris that for the EU to stay relevant, it has to expand. It has to absorb Ukraine. It also has to absorb those countries in the Balkans. And what is the thing that would prevent Serbia from getting welcomed into the EU? It's Kosovo. So if you can just settle this issue somehow and not have it be the thing that all these EU bureaucrats talk about all the time and make you make all these concessions, just wipe it off the board. And then we can just say, hey, we're Serbia. Uh, we were tilting towards Russia. You see, you guys seem to have a good deal. Also, you're really old and your labor is really expensive. We'll make your products. Just move your supply chains over here. We'll do exactly what Poland did for the last 20 years. and We'll do it cheaper and we'll do it better. And we'll be your sort of regional hegemon in the Western Balkans. And boom, the European Union uh, you know, progresses on and finds new markets and things like that. I, I wonder if that had something to do with it, but again, that's that's mostly conjectural. No, I think I think that's exactly what it is, and I think that's where I think credit is due to uh, you know President Vucic, who is you know largely reviled by liberals both inside Serbia and outside. But I think from a geopolitical sense, what he has figured out is again that you need to kind of be a be a little bit of a bully, be be an asshole to be, get noticed. To, um, to incentivize the West to do exactly what you're saying. Like, look, you know, at some point, Brussels has to just like say, or Berlin and Paris have to basically say like, look, we don't really care. It's <laughs> it, like Serbia's 8 million people. You know, it's 8 million people. Just roll all these guys into the EU. And then, and then it doesn't matter whose borders are where. Let's just settle this that way. 
before these become little lily pads for China and Russia in, in Europe. And actually, I think with Serbia's case, they've been much more of a lily pad for China. Like again, to, to Vucic's credit, like, you know, he gets reprimanded every time he does that, but he gets noticed at the same time. And that's why I think that this is happening. Now, obviously, he can take it too far. And the latest incident with, you know, some armed militiamen, like, shooting up a police station, like, that seems off and, and weird. And, you know, it seems like it's going too far. But, and I'm not saying that he's like an evil genius who will always get the right things right. But I think that that's an interesting um, way to describe what's been happening in the region is just that Serbia has figured out that you're not going to get noticed if you remain compliant. Um, now, I think that uh, with Azerbaijan, uh, with Armenia and France, I mean, I think that has to do a lot with the historical connection through the diaspora. Armenian diaspora in France is very large. And so I don't think there's a bigger play than that. I think it's more just uh, more of a domestic political issue for France. Um, and I, I, you know, and I think that the West did send a message by allowing Azerbaijan to do this. First of all, the West needs Azerbaijan's natural gas now that it's basically said no to Russia. Uh, so that's, that's a big issue. The, the other issue is I think just that, um, um, you know, Armenia was a nominal ally of Russia. And so I do think it serves West purposes to illustrate to other nominal allies of Russia, just how vacuous that alliance really is. Yeah, sort of in the same way Russia did that to the United States with Georgia in 2008. Everybody's just showing you that nobody actually comes to your rescue. So as you said, maybe you should just be a bully and figure it out for yourself. Um, you're right that we're both, I, I think you and I are the two people who are out in front about multipolarity. You and I are also two people that I think have been relatively optimistic and bullish on Europe and the European economy um, and Germany in particular. Um, I wonder where you are with that. I'm just finishing up a big research report trying to tackle this story about German industrialization. Is it a myth? Is it not a myth? Is it real? Is it not? You'll have to come back and read the report if you want to know the answer. Um, and I've only written two thirds, so I could completely change my mind here in the next week. But um, I wanted to take your temperature on your bullishness on the EU on the EU over the next couple of years. Are you encouraged by some of the things that are happened? Are you discouraged? Do you think it's just these guys squabble and it's business as usual and the fundamentals and the constraints are just going to push them even if it's not perfect? Uh, I, I just wanted to get your take on Europe right now because I've been a little less optimistic lately. Look, I mean, it, I think it's very simple. If we're in a CAPEX cycle, Europe will do fine because it has CAPEX goods and CAPEX sectors. Um, I think what's been happening over the last six months, so Europe had a great run from September of last year when people realized that natural gas crisis was not going to somehow end Europe, which it didn't and won't, and it will repeatedly get better, just so everybody knows. Like I ran the numbers, they're going to survive another winter, and then by 2025, it's the end. Why? Because there's going to be so much LNG in the global markets that honestly, it's like, it's game over. So, so it's, it, the, this is one of the dumbest issues ever, but like, let's leave that aside. I think what's happened over the last six months is really China. This is all about China, in my view, uh, the trade. Uh, so the weakness in, in German data, the weakness in German trade is related, re, uh, is related to a really significant decline. In Chinese economy, I mean, China is uh, in in outright deflation, mm -hmm. uh, both in uh, um, you know producer prices and consumer prices. Uh, producer prices are actually uh, like deeply deflationary, and uh, this is sort of the most important thing for capex linked economies like Japan, South Korea, and uh, Germany. Um, so I think that as long as China is refusing to put a floor in growth, Europe is going to suffer. But once China puts that floor in growth, once it convinces investors uh, that it's not suicidal, I think that Europe is going to do fine. And so I don't think the euro's headed to parity. Um, I think that euro will settle over the next three months as China convinces investors that it is actually going to, you know, hold the line and not just collapse. To your point there, I mean, go going back to the initial thing, if you got a Trump presidency or any president who didn't have, I mean, Biden has a real old school um, allegiance to the transatlantic partnership and, you know, NATO alliances and good relations with Germany and things like that. If you got a U.S. president who 
who was a flavor of Trump with isolationism and even trade conflicts and trade spats with the European I, I, Union. I, I wonder if the EU wouldn't be singing a very, very different song about China very, very quickly. Of course it would. I mean, I mean, but that's and that's why the U.S. election we led off with it. Not not because just it's like some political conflict. It's because yeah, I mean, like the the entire world is watching the U.S. election because if if Trump does come in and he goes back to, I mean, he doesn't like EU on like an ideological level, mm -hmm. you know, and and you see that with a lot of American even intellectuals, they are just like opposed to the EU on some certain um, ideological normative grounds. And I think that if he comes back <clears throat> and starts uh, treating the EU as a rival, uh, of course, like the EU will respond to that by deepening global multipolarity, um, for sure. And I think that the other issue also is for Europe is that they they've just scratched the surface surface of protectionism. Yeah. Uh, the EU can be a lot more protectionist, and it has been protectionist in the past, as the US has rightly accused it of. And I think that uh, the IRA is a good example of this. They've been extremely opposed to that. Uh, with a Trump administration, uh, I think that they will be even more aggressive. And so you could see something like a green carbon tax at the border, which would, of course, be completely not about you know saving the world from climate change. It will be about ensuring that industrialized goods produced in countries that don't have a high percentage of the energy produced by renewables can have to be taxed at the border in Europe. By the way, if that ever happens, you want to be long Brazil. I, I think you it's already happening. They I, Was it just today that their new carbon tax scheme, India's uh, crying bloody murder about this because now there are all these new regulations and certificates and forms that your steel and your other inputs have to uh, go along with certain carbon goals that the European Union has? Like that's happening anyway. That's why, I mean, you know, I mean, you and I feel the same way about your Brazil's, Mexico, Turkey, Indonesia, we can quibble about which countries are going to do best in this multipolar order, but th that's where the growth opportunities are. And those are the countries that nobody spends any time talking about. And whether you're in the United, like, and it's, this is not just an American thing. Americans look out at the world and they paint every single story with their own politics and perspectives in mind. So does Russia. So does China. Everybody sees things from their own point of view. The hard thing is to like, and I actually said this to an audience just this week, like go read Brazilian papers, like put away the Breitbart or the MSNBC or the CNN, like just read the front page of the Brazilian papers. Google translates good enough now that you can get the gist yeah. and do that for yeah. a couple of weeks. And you will have a very, very different perspective on the world and a country like Brazil's place and how they're thinking about things. So I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't even think you have to wait for that. It's time. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, as as somebody who you know grew up in the Middle East and the Balkans, I mean, those are the two places I grew up in um, until I was sixteen. I think that you, you know, just it's hilarious to me how often people in the West, or as you said, Russia and China, have a perspective that's just very static. Um, and you know, for a long time that was okay because this sort of non-aligned world, like, genuinely didn't matter. Yeah, you know, from a perspective of like GDP share of the. Uh, world of military strength, like these things just didn't matter. Uh, now they they do matter. Now that doesn't mean that like people always say, okay, so then you think BRICS are real, you know, like the BRICS summit is real. No, no, I can still say that that's not real, <laughs> but still also to say that like um, th these economies are very dynamic and interesting, and their perspective is 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 really very different. I mean, uh, I always laugh when in American press someone's accused of being pro Russian, you know. Um, Global South, for, for example, is very ambivalent about Russia's invasion of Ukraine, in part because they just spent a decade watching America invade every country it wanted. You know, like, I mean, uh, so yeah, like in a place like Malaysia or Brazil, like Iraq matters. 1999 bombing of Serbia, like matters, and they will bring that up. And it's so funny to me when Americans are like, oh, but, but that was like a different administration, you know? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's like they know the what? difference. But it's all like a lot of these yeah. countries don't have the luxury of principles. Like Brazil needs fertilizer for its agriculture for the agricultural parts of its economy. And if you need fertilizer, you need it from Russia and Belarus. Like you're not going to have Brazil's agriculture wor or Brazilian agriculture work if you don't have access to fertilizer. So there's a reason that Bolsonaro when the invasion is starting is talking to the Russian government. He may have personal opinions about it. It was the same thing with China. Bolsonaro ran on a very anti-China campaign. He got into office. He saw how much uh, Brazilian trade dependency and future growth was dependent on access to the Chinese market. He changed his tune. Like you don't, 
the, the countries that have the luxury of principles and ideology are those big ones that are sitting on top of it. And most of these other places, like you just don't have the luxury of principles. And to the extent you do have principles, you're exactly right. They view it from a very different perspective. They look at what the United States did in Iraq and Afghanistan. They look at what China is doing in Hong Kong and with Taiwan and everything else. They like, it's, it's just a different world. I will say it's weird. I don't know if you've seen this in, uh, like in Niger, for example, like um, people who are supporting the coup there, they're flying the Russian flag. Somehow the Russian flag has become a talisman of anti-Westernism, even though Russia has always been a Western power, was a Western imperialist power, like was a, like, it w- just wasn't the big daddy colonialist power because it fell apart before it could actually conquer all of its colonies. But there are plenty of zones around Russia that uh, have something to say about that. Um, it's an well, ironic no, think, thing. Sorry. No, 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 no. Let, let's, let's hold a little bit there. Because I don't know if your listeners actually like have caught up on that, and and I definitely caught that. Basically, in Niger there was a coup, and partly partly the coup was about security, you know, yeah. about the government not providing uh, enough security against various rebels, most of whom are uh, extremely uh, radical Islamists. And so Wagner is is running around Africa, basically making a deals with these governments. Like, hey, we'll deal with your Islamist rebels in extremely inhumane ways because we're Wagner, yeah. <laughs> and you will pay us seem like diamonds, you know. And you know, um, I think that one of the reasons that there's frustration in Central Africa and um, in Sub-Saharan Africa and in any of the Maghreb is that the West is kind of walking on eggshells, not taking, not not going to the extreme. And there's these Russian mercenaries running around who will do whatever you want from them as long as you pay them in diamonds. And I think that that's, that's part of, you know, that's, in a way, it's connected on some level with like Larry Summers' point that when American diplomats show up, they give you a lecture. When the Chinese show up, they give you, um, you know, a loan or a bridge or a railway. And I guess when Russians show up, they just kill your rebels for you. <laughs> and it's, you know, and it's like, and what, what was interesting to me was that the public is like, yeah, no, no, we want those Russians to just kill the rebels. Like, that's what we want. Like, bring them back, send the French home, you know. And um, I think that what that tells you is that a multipolar world is very difficult to run on a normative moral basis mm-hmm. because nobody's in charge to impose norms and morals and then enforce them with force. So when there's a multitude of countries that are involved, you are going to default to a realist, real politic, Machiavellian world, um, and that's I think what's happening. That's a that's a really interesting. I want to pick up on that point in a second. I also just want to point out that you're exactly right. These are mostly Islamists, like radical jihadists and things like that. And these folks, like the United States, played a role in this. Like we went into the Middle East, we crushed ISIS, we got rid of ISIS. There's no more Islamic State anymore. We didn't kill them all. They all just went to other places where there were power vacuums. So we didn't clean up the the dirty business that we did in the Middle East. And one of one of my most epically wrong forecasts ever. And it's out there. You can read it if you want. It's published. It's it's all. It's, epically bad was I said that Russia and the United States one place where they would have some common ground is that they both hated jihadists so maybe they would work together in the Middle East with jihadists and then together this could form some kind of basis for Russia and US cooperation in the years ahead I think I wrote that in like 2018 that didn't work very well, I mean, well. you weren't wrong no I, I don't think you were wrong I think that was true it's just that there were these other bigger issues to, that like well, yes, but unravel that cooperation. And I, yeah. I didn't unravel I mean, like in the report. I'm just like, this is what's going to happen. And the report should have been like, this makes sense, but it's not going to happen for X, Y, and Z reasons. So, but just the, the, yeah, I the think, point. I think what, no, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, so, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, no, just that, you know, Russia is chasing the, the jihadists that they, they destroyed in the Middle East, like in parts of such. Whereas we, I mean, unless you're AFRICOM and you're trying to justify your budget in the US, like we don't care about this stuff. Like nobody's, most people probably couldn't even point to Niger on a map or know the difference between Niger and Nigeria uh, to, to start with. So I, I think you're exactly right there. But the, the second thing you said that I just want to, because I think that was a really good point, because um, in, in a unipolar world, you do have the hegemon and that hegemon is going to have a perspective and principles and an ideology and everything else. And if you're in a bipolar world, um, this is sort of, it's dualism, right? It's light versus dark. It's capitalism versus yeah. communism. And both sides is going to paint the other to be um, the negative thing. And you just sort of crystallize something in my head. In a multipolar world, nobody has ideology. It's everybody just do what's best for your nation because, I I don't know, we're not capable of having nuance when it comes to ideology. There is no capitalism in this corner and communism in this corner. There is 
Chinese nationalism and the rejuvenation of the Chinese state. There is Russian nationalism and the return of the you know Russian Russia to its places of prestige and power and things like that. And the interesting thing about this, or maybe the disturbing thing about this, is the United States has bought into that hook, line, and sinker. And it doesn't say that. Man. Our vocabulary is still liberty, freedom, shining city on the hill, blah, blah, blah. But in practice, what does the world see us do? Who are the countries that we have good relations with? Like when you actually start to parse it down, like, no, it's all about U.S. interests. It's all about, as you said, protecting the U.S. middle class or protectionism in the in the global economy. So I, that's maybe the best signpost we've seen yet for a multipolar world. The fact that there, there are no morals, there is no ideology that people are clawing to. Yeah, I think I think it's interesting. I mean, you could argue that in the Cold War there was some of that, for example, with the uh, Soviet Union supporting various nationalist movements in Europe, including uh, you know, like like giving Irish nationalists like trying to get them weapons and stuff like that. And what's interesting about that, that's true, but like the KGB guy or the GRU guy who shows up and tries to give you a check would always be like, Hey, can you just like maybe write a manifesto about like <laughs> private property? You know, just can you check some boxes for us here? Um, and you know, a lot of these, a lot of these groups did that. They had a sort of a, you know, like nominally communist ideology, socialist ideology to get the money. Yeah. Today, you don't even have to do that. That's the point. There is no, there is no normative value. You know, people try in America, especially. There's this whole like, oh, CCP somehow, you know, communist or something like. No, come on, man. Like, have you been to Shanghai? Please. There is no ideological normative, I think, um, issues anymore because in a multipolar world, it, 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 no one's powerful enough to enforce them. Yeah. And I think that that creates opportunities for really interesting alliances. Um, and you know, you saw Joe Biden go to Vietnam, and of course, um, you know, there's there's an effort to peel Vietnam away from China. Uh, Vietnam and China have a history that like U.S. can wedge itself into, and so on. Um, but what's interesting to me is that two things are happening in Vietnam. First of all, liberal America is you know talking about human rights violations in Vietnam and all these things, and accusing Joe Biden of just like ignoring them. Uh, but the bigger issue to me is that China is flooding Vietnam with FDI, just flood like hosing down the entire country with FDI, so that Chinese factories can be built in the country to then subvert American tariffs. I call this enemy shoring. <laughs> China's doing it in Vietnam. China's doing it in Mexico as well. Look at the FDI data of China into Mexico. So Chinese private, I mean, this isn't even like government sponsored, like just private businesses in China yeah. are smart and they're like, we'll outsource, we'll enemy shore. And so everyone in America, like the, the CFR people are like, oh, look, Vietnam is trading with America more. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's China trading with you. Like, and, and you know it because I don't think you're that dumb. I think you've looked at the data, but you're not going to say anything about it because you want the Vietnamese to profit off of this and you don't want to push back on it because then you will, you know, like lose them as a strategic ally. And I think that's another good example. That it's, it's not just looking past somebody's ideology or human rights record. It's even looking past their very industrial and economic policy. They may very well be a, like subverting your foreign policy for the middle class. And by the way, if if Jake Solomon has a problem with outsourcing to China, as he seems to have in the Brookings speech, why is he okay with it with Vietnam? You know, are, are we not still like in some way hurting the American middle class? And, and obviously no one can answer that question because it's all back to us and it's just PR. Well, I mean, you're right on so many different scores there. Um, first of all, Vietnam is a communist country. The Vietnamese Communist Party shares a lot in common with the Chinese Communist Party. And they're having some of the same real estate issues and everything else that you know China's having. In some ways, they're much more ideologically in sync with China than they are with the United States. So there's that point. The other point is one of the, I guess this was a year before Trump left office. I think it was the year before January 6th. I don't know if you remember this. He woke up one day and was like, the Vietnamese currency, which is the dong, for those of you who didn't know, wonderful currency that's out there. He said he was going to put them on the currency manipulator list. <laughs> and like, I know multiple US companies that were like, oh shit, like that doesn't work. Like we need, we need, we can't have going after the dong. Like we need the dong to do well because this is part of our whole industrial supply chain. So it goes back to sort of some of the things we were talking about there at the very beginning. And the last thing I would just say is um, <clears throat> I think a lot of people date the beginning of the US 
China trade war and the U.S. protectionism bent to uh, to Biden. But he doesn't deserve that accolade. It started with Obama in 2014, and it started when a U.S. tire company, I'm forgetting which one it was, said, hey, China's dumping tires into our market. And the Obama administration used the same things that the Trump administration used to have you know protectionist tariffs and things like that on tires. And China retaliated with chicken and poultry products, and it was this back and forth thing. And you know what happened in the end? Uh, tires didn't go back to the United States. Uh, China had a little, little less chicken and countries like Vietnam became the top tire producers in the world. Like, so unless you're going to squash like all the different markets and have protectionism, you're exactly right. And I mean, Vietnam is not a, yeah, I mean, there's so many different reasons that Vietnam is not the glittering solution that a lot of Western companies want it to be. In some ways, the time to be in Vietnam was seven, eight years ago. Like now you sort of have to go to the next order thing. If you're just getting into Vietnam now, like you're too late. It's not there. The entire time that, I mean, I agree with everything. I was just trying to restrain myself from following up with a lot of non-family friendly ways to involve the currency dog in a sentence. Marco, you should know by now that this is the one safe space where you don't have to restrain yourself. I mean, if you're, if you're worried about getting canceled or something, that's fine. But like, I don't do it on my accord. I'm, I'm not blushing over <laughs> here. Um, before we turn to some over-unders and some basketball talk, I think this is also just a good time because we haven't really talked about markets that much. And I, I think the... The China part of this is maybe the thing that is the most important or the most uh, that links into some of the things that we're talking about. You posted a chart recently, which I stole in some of my recent presentations that showed the delinking of Chinese growth with lots of um, you know, US assets and things like that. I believe it was the 10 year treasury yield versus the Chinese growth was, was what you were looking at. It was a beautiful picture of, of deglobalization. And it just as we take a step back and try and you know put a narrative on everything that we've just talked about, I think one really compelling way to look at it is, look, China's in deflation. The European Union is in this weird netherland where it doesn't quite know what to do. And the United States is growing like gangbusters. And then all these emerging economies are doing different things in different parts of the world. That that doesn't look like globalization. It doesn't look like the old world. It's completely different. But I don't think that part of the story where, okay, China's delinked from this stuff. It's not about Chinese growth anymore. Like, that's the past. Like If you're expecting, oh, China's just going to come out with the stimulus bazooka, and finally, we're going to be back off to the races. Like, even if they come out with the stimulus bazooka, maybe it doesn't work and they might not come out with it anyway. So I just wanted to give you a chance to riff on that for a little bit. And maybe we should just talk a little bit about how that old model of China is the consumer and you know everybody, and they're also the low cost factory, like that, that world is gone. It's not coming back. Well, what I would say is that um, I would maybe disagree a little bit that the chart shows um, that we're not globalized anymore. I think other charts show that globalization was at a peak. I think what that chart shows is is exactly what you said in the latter part of your statement, which is that China's not the growth engine. Mm. And by the way, that's that's okay. First of all, let's back up. One of the things I love about macro, what one of the things I love about macro investing is that you can never become an expert at it. So you have to have a little bit, yeah, you have to be a little bit of a heterodox thinker who just hates consensus. That the only maybe world where that's fine is macro. Why? Because macro investing is like playing chess, where every five to eight years, the chess pieces decide to move completely differently. And yeah. you have to find out how they're moving and then adopt your strategy. So um, the chart that you're talking about shows um, uh, Chinese total social financing, so credit growth over 12, uh, um, um, basically 12 month forward, Chinese credit growth linked to the 10-year yield. And it basically suggests that from 2008 to 2017, Chinese credit growth mattered more for US 10-year yield than anything else in the world. And that's because Chinese credit growth was the only engine of growth at a time when Europe and the US had austerity, where American consumers were basically in a balance sheet recession trying to deleverage. At that point, it was all about China. And then in 2017, something interesting happens. Trump does pro-cyclical stimulus. Then, of course, we get COVID and we have this explosion of stimulus. Um, so, in a way, we're in the same world we were in the last cycle, except now it's the Chinese consumers that are deleveraging. They're now in secular stagnation. American consumers are now leading the charge. And American consumers, by the way, um, American households are 70% of US GDP. Mm -hmm which means that U.S. households are 17.5% of global GDP, which is basically equivalent to China. 
So, you know, uh, you have a lot of people out there being like commodity bears. They're like, well, commodities can't go up because, you know, China's like vomiting. And my point is like, yeah, but you do have to understand American households are China. And if they start consuming goods, you're going to have to build factories. You're going to have to build assembly lines. You're going to have to build ports or expand, mm -hmm. you know, build new railroads, get more nickel, get more cobalt. You're going to have to do all this stuff if American households are awake. And so that's what I think is happening. I think it's, you just have these periods where some, where the engine of growth for the world is different. And these periods usually last about a decade. So 2002 to 2009, yes, China was industrializing. Yeah, that was important. But remember, China was a very small economy in 2001, 2002. 2002 to 2008 was also the US consumer. It was the real estate bubble in the US. So you have US lead the first part of this um, century. Then you have China take over as American households have to kind of like take a breather. Now Chinese households are taking a breather, so America is, is, is taking charge. And I think a lot of people are making that a cognitive error because they're so used to the last cycle where China led everything and they're like, well, China's now, you know, not healthy. We can't possibly have strong growth. We can't possibly have a commodity super cycle. And, and I think that's a, that's a wrong thing because it just, China is just less diagnostic. Now, if China collapses, I will agree with those people. If you have complete and utter collapse of China's economy, it's difficult to be bullish copper no matter how many EVs we build. But I also don't think Chinese policymakers are suicidal. So I do expect not a big bazooka, but I expect them to put a floor in growth. And that will be just enough. That will be fine. You can have a commodity super cycle. You can have a CapEx super cycle. But we do need China to convince everyone that they're going to put a floor in growth. But what I would say is maybe the most interesting of all of this is that what's the number one thing happening right now as we're recording this, it's October 4th, we're having a bond market riot. And that's what's really interesting because a lot of my clients who are bond bulls, they will bring up China as one of the reasons to hold bonds. Mm -hmm. You know, and what, I'm, what I really like, and this is one of the ways I invest, when something happens geopolitically or politically or macroeconomically that should be bullish or bearish for an asset, and that asset doesn't care, look up. So let me wind back. May of 2014, Mosul, the second largest city in Iraq, mm -hmm. falls to a bunch of raving lunatics, the Islamic State, who then declare a caliphate and you know head out to the suburbs of Baghdad. Yeah. <laughs> Iraq is like, what, the fourth largest exporter of oil in the world? Mm -hmm. And you have these raving lunatics running through it. What does oil do? In Q2 of 2014, it absolutely okay. collapses. And I remember May of 2014, I was bullish oil at the end of 2013 and early 2014, one of the worst things I've ever done in my life. But I was smart enough to see when Mosul got invaded and oil didn't even budge. That was one of those moments where you were like, oh my God, this is a profoundly bearish world for oil if this doesn't yeah. even bump oil prices a little bit. Similarly, last year when Russia invades Ukraine, smart people, not us, but smart people start talking about nuclear war. What do bonds do? Rally about 50 base points and then take off. And that was another one, like, oh my God. Similarly, right now, China's basically, you know, deeply ill, the economy is not doing well, the policymakers are behind a curve, and bonds just don't care. So to me, this macro context is telling us that we're in a profoundly bond bearish environment. If Chinese col uh, economic collapse in 2023 and potential nuclear war in 2022 don't create a sustainable rally in the safest, supposedly safest asset on the planet, which is the 10-year U.S. Treasury. Where do you look instead then? Like, is it is it is it so contrarian that you say, all right, like China is sort of at you know sort of a, the bottom of sentiment, and maybe now is the time to start doing bargain basement hunting in China? Is it no go to emerging markets? Is it no play the commodities? Like, where where, where are you looking from a positive basis? I think uh, commodities are going to replace bonds as safe haven asset. Hmm. Like that's that's what I think. I think. Uh, uh, and you know a melange of commodities. Don't don't be stuck on on one or the other. Uh, a very sophisticated client I talked to yesterday uh, pointed out to me that gold volatility relative to bond volatility is, is unnaturally low. Hmm. I did the chart of this going back as far as we could, um, and it's true. It's it's insanely low. So gold hasn't performed well for the last 
you know, four to six months, but it's not volatile. It's it's stable. And the argument being like, look, there is a changing of the guard in terms of what is considered like a safe haven asset. Um, so I think commodities, I think commo- you want to own commodities. And it, it's not just about the green energy transition or the capex. It's also the fact that we haven't invested in commodities. There has been less mm-hmm. capex than there should have been for the past decade. That's picking up a little bit, but not enough. Um, so that's the first. And the second thing is you asked about China as an investment opportunity. Yeah. I mean, look, I think Chinese stocks are going to pop at some point. They'll do what they did after October, you know, after the end of zero COVID, uh, when they were like basically the best performing asset for about three months. Um, you know, you, you might have six months where Chinese stocks do really, really well. But, um, you know, long term, China's going to be uh, a trade. I think long term, China is like a tactical opportunity mm-hmm. where you will make a lot of money, but you have to trade it actively yeah. for, for the rest of this decade. That makes sense. Um, a few over unders, and then let's talk about what we really want to talk about, which is basketball. Um, so these are over unders for by December thirty first. So just over the next you know two three months, uh, oil at ninety five a barrel over or under. Um, over the next twelve months? No, but end of the year. So December thirty first is oil above or below ninety five? Uh, I think above. Above. How about you? Um, well, uh, it's weird. I, I was right to be bearish the first half of this year. And then the, you know, the Saudis cut a bunch and I was thinking, all right, they maybe now have cut enough to sort of send things up. Um, you know, we're recording on October 4th, pretty, pretty ugly candle today in oil. So, um, I'm sort of, I'm sort of oil didn't quite do what I was expecting this week. So I'm a little bit confused, but if you had asked me yesterday, even I would have said over, but I'm, I'm a little confused with, um, right now here in this moment. Well- I think the the move in bonds is probably raising well not probably it is raising the probability of a recession, and so you know that could put a, a dampener on an oil rally. Yeah. So that's something to just watch. Although oil can rally quite violently ahead of a recession, and that's happened almost ahead of every recession. So just that's why I'm saying over. Well, yeah, and sort of the cumulative impact of Russian oil being not off the market but harder to get for western countries for a long time yeah. like china maybe some green shoots in the economy the saudis have cut production for quite a while now like you start to put it together like it, it looks good but um i'm, I'm not well quite- chinese oil demand has been chinese oil demand has been surging yeah. it's been like massive <clears throat> and a, a lot of folks are asking why there's some conspiracy theory maybe they're getting ready to invade taiwan i don't think that's the case i think what's happening is that mobility in china is extremely uh active and healthy yeah the, so people are sick and tired of being stuck at home so there is demand for oil from chinese industry as well yeah um 10-year treasury yields 4.75 percent december 31st over under oh you you picked the line really well that's what i did Uh, i think over i think over so i've been bearish uh, bonds um you know since july and uh in our annual forecast we actually said you wanted to own bonds in the first half of the year uh first quarter Sorry, first quarter, and then you, you wanted to sell them in the back uh, end of the year. So I'm very proud of that call. Uh, we doubled down on that call uh, at the beginning of September and also at the beginning of October. So we've been pounding on this. Um, I don't want to catch a falling knife. We did hit 4.8. Yep. We did sell. I think now we're talking, I think it came down a little bit. Uh, the bonds rallied. I don't know. I just, uh, I'm comfortable not catching a falling knife here i want to see where it goes and, and what happens yeah i'm i'm with you here and for me the canary in the coal mine is rising inflation rates in places like brazil like india like the bank of thailand jacking up interest rates unexpectedly last week like i don't know i, I have a feeling that we haven't seen the end of inflation in the united states and if inflation is going to do another little uptick here and if we're right about the oil call i don't see the fed sort of pausing anytime soon and then you know maybe we get into that realm so um Last of the over unders is the DAX today is at fifteen thousand roughly, um, so over under thirteen thousand by the end of the year. Oh, uh, I would think over just because I think by the end of the year, Chinese policymakers will blink. We have a very important Politburo meeting in December. I think they're they're waiting to see what happens. Uh, they're not convinced that during the balance sheet recession, they they're not convinced of that. They think that everything is fine and their con- their consumers and their households will continue to consume if you just cut interest rates and if you just give them a little bit better real estate uh, conditionality. Uh, I just think they're wrong. I think they're in a balance sheet recession. I think it'll be clear 
by December, the data will deteriorate, and then China is going to have to capitulate, do more stimulus, and that should help uh, you know, all associated uh, indices and assets like Germany, Japan, and so on. I'm going to take the under on this one just because, and I chose that line because that's roughly where Germany was last October, where the DAX was last October. And um, I just think natural gas markets have been a little bit too complacent. And I, I think you're right about that. I would quibble with you on 2025. I think 2026 is really when we get the LNG glut, maybe. Um, but it's going to be difficult for energy security for Germany over the next year or two. They got a reprieve from an unprecedentedly warm winter last year. Maybe they get another unprecedentedly warm winter and everything can go well. But I'm not convinced that we're not going to see another run up in natural gas prices. And I'm I'm thinking that until Germany really can get energy security and energy costs under control, yeah. Um, I don't feel great about. I don't. I'm not not on the deindustrialization chain train right now, but I, I do think there might be a little bit more room for for German equities to to kind of not do well here over the next two or three months. The only thing I would remind you know you and everyone who's kind of bearish in Europe is like Europe spent a trillion dollars subsidizing industry mm -hmm. last um, last year, and they'll do it again if they have to. They won't need to do a trillion, but they'll do whatever it takes um, until we get to that bridge. And for some reason, people always forget that. And and it's like, well, how can they afford to do that? Well, if you look at like the cost of financing debt, U.S. versus Germany, there's your trillion dollars. Yeah. You know, America has been much more profligate. Um, its uh, maturity uh, uh, length is shorter than German, so they've mismanaged their sort of debt load, and so the U.S. pays a lot more just to service its debt. Germany doesn't really have that much debt. And so it's like, eh, whatever, we'll just make the difference. And I, I know it sounds callous and a lot of people that blow up their brain, they're like, but no, German industry is leveraged to Russian gas. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, please stop reading that crap, number one. Number two, it's like they'll bridge their way to 2026 by printing money. Like that's just, and you know, it's funny. I said that last year, people looked at me like I was crazy and that's exactly what they did. They ended up just spending a trillion dollars and it was enough. And this year, maybe it'll be 500. It'll be less and less. And then when we get to 2025 or 2026, it doesn't really matter, which is really like a decade away, that global LNG price will collapse anyways, and things will be fine. Interesting fodder for when Italy and Germany decide to talk about budget deficit issues, if that's what Germany does. Um, all right, let's, let's, let's talk a little basketball. I imagine that it's very difficult. Well, I don't know. Is it difficult for you? Because Jokic is like has taken over the NBA. Everybody loves him. He's dancing in clubs in Serbia, like in the off season and things like that. Um, but then the Lakers, you know, uh, apparently think that they should, that, that, that the Nuggets were too disrespectful. I mean, I don't know if you saw this. Apparently, yeah, Mike, uh, I did. C Coach Malone introduced himself as the Lakers daddy. And there's like all yeah. this trash talk going on. And it's like the Lakers are all like, we've now circled opening day. Like we're going to show the Nuggets who's boss. Like they swept you. Like you didn't even win a game. Uh, it was tight, though. They, the four-game total <laughs> victory total was 24 points. Okay. Well, they, they still lost four games. Like, it's... <laughs> and they didn't win. No, look. I'll, I'll, of course. Of course. I, I mean, I think... I mean, whatever. It's preseason and, like, the, the back and forth is, like, hilarious. Um, I think... Um, so, I'll tell you what I like about the Lakers. I think in this new world of load management, of injuries, of all this stuff, I think what you want to do when you construct the team, you want to do what major European soccer clubs do. Mm. So when you think about like European soccer leagues, if you're like Brighton or something, you really just play like two leagues. You, you play a lot less games than Liverpool or Arsenal. Why? Because you got to play the League Cup if you're a top team. And you have to pay, play the domestic league. Then you probably have great players who have to uh, go off and play for their national team during the break and then you have of course continental championships whether it's like you know champions league or whatever else so you basically are playing in four three and a half leagues and so managers football managers like soccer managers have to construct a team that basically have like three starting lines you have to be able to like rest your stars or play them 20 minutes you know at the end against some like you know bottom of the table team what I like about the Lakers is they are basically constructed for that. You know, they are very deep. Like LeBron can easily take a, uh, a game off and Austin Reeves can be in his spot. And I know like internet will blow up. Like, oh, more quickly. Austin Reeves is as good as LeBron. 
Well, number one, so do the Philippine uh, fans, apparently. He was like a star at the FIBA basketball. <laughs> but the second thing is, it's like, whatever. You know, like if you play the Orlando Magic in like February, that's your League Cup analogy. You know, you're playing some second division team for the League Cup. Like, come on, you know, you can put in the young kids. And I think that that's really good. That's really, that that's a really good um, way to think about this. I think the problem with the Nuggets, with the Bucks, and especially with the Celtics, is that they're very, very thin. Okay, Celtics are young. You know, Jason Tatum is 26 years old. God bless him. He should play 82 games, 37 minutes a game. But, you know, like the, the Denver Nuggets were a little bit too, I think, relaxed this offseason. I mean, Jamal Murray has injury pass. Jokic didn't touch a weight or a basketball unless he was beer, you know? Like, come on, man. Like, we all, we know. I mean, the guy is awesome and I love everything about him. But, you know, he's going to have to play himself into shape. And then the Bucs basically just, I mean, they, they have Dame Lillard. I don't think he could guard me in the post. Mm. So they're, and they're extremely thin as well. And I think that if this new uh, era is all about having depth, uh, which it might be, I mean, at least that's what, that's, that, that's I think what the Lakers have banked on. They're like, look, we're gonna have depth of like nine deep, like nine starters deep. So I I like it. Uh, as for my loyalties, I mean, I'm a Laker fan. Listen, I um, my hero is Vlade Divac um, as a player, and I cheered against him when he was on the King. So wow. I I literally like if you cut me, like purple will come out. So um, you know, uh, but what I do like about the Nuggets. And, and maybe we can switch to geopolitics here too, is they're led by a Canadian and a Serb. And what's funny is neither one of them played at the World Championship where Canada and Serbia did great. Yep. Um, and that's, that's I think, uh, really interesting. I think the Olympics, I'm so excited about the Olympics coming up in Paris, um, maybe more than for the basketball season. Yeah, well, first of all, listeners, you heard it here first. Uh, Austin Reeves is the reincarnation of LeBron James, and Marco Papic uh, has volunteered to be the Dame breaker. He will personally post up Dame for any team that needs to uh, take advantage yes. of the Bucks' um, over-reliance on Dame and Giannis at the top. You're right, though. The league is very international. I mean, Giannis, most important yeah. player. He's at the top of the Bucks. Jokic on top of... Uh, on top of um, on top of the Nuggets. The Canadians are really coming. Like, it's, it's sort of a bad time SGA. for... It's a bad time for U.S. basketball players. We've sort of gotten used to jacking up the threes, and everybody's gonna gonna go along with it, and it just doesn't work. It's why I think the Suns are gonna be. I don't know. They'll probably make me look bad, but my hot take right now is that's a disaster. Like you're you're gonna Man. have Beal and Durant and Booker, and I mean they just traded Aiton for basically nothing. Like all respect We're to Nurkic. Like like I mean, how's that gonna work? Like probably Beal's gonna twist an ankle. KD's gonna have another injury. Booker's gonna have to do hero ball all by himself. And it's like it just does, like we already saw this movie in Brooklyn. It doesn't work. There's no chemistry. I, it's just you know it's it's well no, but this is yeah. You know what, Jacob? This is this is what's interesting to me. Everyone, you know, there was this meme, uh, Jokic holding a horse, you know, <laughs> and it's like it was like everyone's trying to like get at this man, you know. Everyone's making all these trades, but they got they gotta go through this man, and it's so true. What happened against the Lakers? What happened against the Lakers is when the game got tight, Yoki Chimori would play pick and roll, yeah. or Yoki would just take AD in the post and eat him like a snake swallowing a frog. And, and let's just be clear, AD single-handedly destroyed the Warriors. I mean, destroyed them. Yeah. It was like a man playing against boys well, and and and, 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 de and and destroyed Jokic a couple years ago. Like that was the amazing thing. I was expecting that to happen again. You know what? Actually, that didn't happen. In 2020, in that series, Howard, Dwight Howard. Showed, oh, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, you're right about that. No, and JaVale McGee actually guarded Jokic. There were a couple of moments at the end, you're right, where, where AD switched on to him or the Lakers played small. Even in 2020, I watched this, I remember this, I'm a Lakers fan and a Jokic fan, so I remember this as if it's yesterday. Jokic absolutely abused AD. Mm. There were a couple of moments when it was just like going through he, he was like 80 wasn't there. So what am I getting at? What I'm getting at here is that a lot of these teams in the East are like engaging this cold war against one another. Bucks, Heat, Celtics. Who's going to guard Jokic in any of those teams? I mean, if the Celtics get to the finals, like how, how are they going to guard Jokic? Like yeah. Al Horford, your buddy from Atlanta? Like 
Good luck with that. So no, that's that's no, kind of the no no guy who's as big as Al Horford who can't average ten rebounds a game is my buddy. Let's get that clear from the start with. I, I think Giannis could maybe do it. You don't think Giannis could? No, 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 no. Listen, no, 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 no. This is this is I know this because I have the same genetic material as Jokic, so okay. I know this. And, and by th- by which I mean there is no definition in any of my <laughs> bottle. Like there's no that I could I could work out eight hours a day. I won't have definition. What am I getting at? It doesn't matter. Like some athletic young kid tries to guard you is just meat. It's is just meat, you know. Like who has more meat? And nobody has more meat than Jokic. The only people that can really guard him are like you know the problem with bigger centers that can guard him in the post. Obviously, he's smart. He'll take him with the trigger. So no one can guard. That's that's my point. But at least you you need to have some size. And Giannis doesn't have that. He's too light. So that's the first issue. The second issue is I loved after the the ignominious defeat of this American team. I mean, they just got completely mm-hmm. like destroyed in this. Yeah, embarrassing in many ways. And then when Canada beats the US, it's just in basketball, you know, like the world will stop with its axis. <laughs> and what I loved after this happened, my favorite part was all these basically like geriatrics, geriatrics saying like, oh, I got this. And all my American <laughs> bodies are like, yo, you just wait for the Olympics, man. Oh, yeah. We got Curry, we got KD, we got LeBron. And I was just sitting there like, and I'm like, and do you have some canes for them? Are they going to be like sponsored by Advil and Shoals? Like what kind of a, are you kidding me? Are yeah. you are you joking right now? Like Dennis Schroeder will dance on Curry's grave, man. Are you kidding me? Like no way. There is no way that a bunch of 38 year olds are going to make it close. And, and what I mean by that is like, the redeem stream in 2008, the 2012 Olympics, those were close games. Yeah. Kobe Bryant, peace be upon him, <laughs> had to elevate himself to godlike status to allow America to win in 2008 with a young LeBron and young, you know, um, um, C- CP3 and, and so on. So, uh, so I would say this. I mean, obviously Booker. And Jason Tatum, hey, God bless him. If that team like elevates them, I think the U.S. definitely wins. I think they're favorites. But man, if anyone's like saying like, "Oh man, LeBron said, hold my beer, I'm going to the Olympics," I'm like, and he's gonna do what? He's gonna be like exhausted from the player front. He's gonna be 40 years old. Like you know, look up. It's still gonna be close. Yeah. And it's not. It, and it's just. It's awesome. I mean, I think as someone who. Loves basketball. I think this is this is really awesome. We live in an awesome era of basketball. Yeah. All right. Well, here's my hot take for you. First of all, uh, I love the idea of, of Advil and these other things uh, sponsoring uh, people like or, or Scholes uh, sponsoring Steph Curry. But uh, you know, Steph Curry used to be sponsored by FTX. So if he would like to fix that part of his reputation, both you and I are in the investment world, and we are not charlatans. Um, the second thing is, I, I think that uh, the second most I think Jokic has the second most meat in the league. And the the winner of the most meat in the league has to be Zion Williamson. And as we are sitting here in New Orleans with the Pelicans, it's all about whether Zion's healthy. If this is the year, if Zion has finally been shamed and getting healthy, and we're getting we got these pictures last year, but he looks he looks good. He looks like he's been doing stuff in the gym. Oh no. This Whoa, last turn of year. You're like, not falling no, no, for I'm, the Twitter. I'm piece. not I'm saying like it's it's possible. Like he could do it. And this also goes to the Olympics because the dream team, everybody thinks it was magic and Jordan. That was no, Charles Barkley. Barkley's team. And Zion yeah. Williamson is cool. Like Charles Barkley, but like add another human and compress him in the same amount of space. So Zion, well, I, if I like you, the stake. If you can get through a season, you are the leader of the redeemed team, and you will bring uh, order back to the universe. But uh, I'll put the odds at that at probably about five percent. <laughs> no, listen, that's a really cool take, and, and I'll say something else. I think um, so. You know, we 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 make joke of the of the meat factor. I mean, like, look, the problem with Zion is that he doesn't play like a chunky player. I mean, he plays like a explosive player. So he needs to watch his weight, yeah. you know? Guys like Jokic and Doncic, by the way. Doncic is yeah. like same so strong. They have they have the game where they don't really need athleticism and I think that that's where that girth comes into play. And by the way, one thing I liked about the Mavericks last year is they finally figured out to put Doncic in the post. Yeah. You know, and, and I mean, he's unguardable in the post by basically a traditional uh, current NBA 3 and D guy cannot guard Doncic in the post. The problem is that Doncic has the Harden disease. 
And I don't know how you cure that. Uh, somebody has to basically tell him like, like, hey man, like you don't have to dance for 20 seconds at the top of the key while your teammates stare at you from the perimeter. So I hope that that gets resolved. Um, and then it'll be interesting. It's, but, not, it's, uh, not yeah, the hard, it's not the Harden disease. It's the American basketball disease. He's been infected by American basketball. He's, he doesn't play like a European. Like he needs to get back to playing like a European player. That's what made him great. I mean, listen, I mean, I'm not really going to argue against that because I think one of the biggest problems with the Lakers too was that, you know, they were so effective when AD and um, uh, Reeves were doing pick and roll. And then LeBron was kind of on the block or on the other weak side. And then you swing it to LeBron. Okay, fine. You know, the pick and roll didn't work out. LeBron, do your thing. But when LeBron is at the top of the key, you know, dancing around like he's 27, I mean, I get a brain aneurysm. And to me, it's like, listen, you are the same size as Carl Malone. Can you please just go down into the paint? Can you work on the baby hook over the off season so that you can just dominate all these other uh, players? And I think that... Um, you're right. So that's that is the disease, and I, I think it's a problem uh, for for Lakers too. Well, and, and it goes back to Zion because you're right about how Zion plays right now. It's all athleticism. It's all about who am I going to dunk on and everything else. But he's got the girth. He's got the body type. So if he instead of if it was ni- instead of ninety percent athleticism and ten percent you know using his body, if it was the other way around, if he saved the ten percent for when he really needed yeah. it and said the rest of the time I'm just going to do my best. Zach Randolph impression, and I'm gonna like be really good on defense. Not that I'm gonna run around, but like you know, if Jokic wants to shoot threes, that's fine. But if he comes in the post, he's getting Zion. He's getting the Zion experience. Like if he can focus on doing that, um, there's a path for him. But he has there is Listen. nothing that he has shown that he's capable of that. But he does have the skill, the tools to do that if he so chooses. I I just uh, the fact that you just dropped a Zebo reference with such like just. You know, like without breaking rhythm. Like I actually have a Randolph jersey. I don't know if you know this because I, I basically patented my game on Z. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, exactly. I mean, he's he's a great, great, great guy. I mean, by the way, little side note on Zebo. There's a great video, great video of the Marcus Cousins just being Cousins. You know, just being annoying mm-hmm. and just like yelling at people, pushing people. And Zebo just looks at him and says, "On my block, bullies get bullied." <laughs> That's my favorite <laughs> trash talk moment in NBA history. And and you know what? To DeMarcus Cousins' credit, he just looks at z and goes like, well, I'm not going to say it. It's funny you say that because one of my favorite NBA trash talk moments also has to do with DeMarcus Cousins. And it's where Cousins is talking about playing Tim Duncan. And like, oh yeah, and, and cousins like dunked on uh, on Duncan once or twice, something like that, and got up all up, all up in his face, and like Duncan kind of looked at him, and then like proceeded to score like forty points and have twenty rebounds. And every time he did I, I, he did something, he'd like slap him on the butt and be like, "Good try, <laughs> like, good job." I, I literally I have seen that YouTube clip of Duncan doing that, and he's like forty two year old man yeah. doing it, which is which just makes it even so much I more know. funny because he's got he's like gray, and he's just like, "Wait, are you Josh? Mm-hmm. Josh, talking me?" No, listen, I think this is going to be a very exciting season. Uh, I love what's happening with all the international players. Um, and I think that, you know, Victor Wembayama, another very interesting hmm. um, question, what's going to happen with that? Uh, I think that he went to a great situation. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I just think that the Spurs are probably going to, uh, you know, sit him for half of the season, though. <clears throat> Well, yeah. Speaking of meat, he's somebody that needs to put some meat on if he's going to survive, because otherwise it's... Uh... Yeah, like yeah, it might be Porzingis kind of a thing, you know. Um, I, I mean, the the two games I watched in the summer season, what I was uh, really concerned about is the way he jumps yeah. and lands. He just looks off. Um, so I, I don't I don't know what that's going to look like, but it'll be interesting. Yeah. Anyways, it's a great season. Olympics are going to be awesome. Can't wait for that. Um, and hopefully, by the way, Serbia was second at the World Championship without its two best players. Two best players. Where Serbia did not play. Uh, one is actually Mitic, who's now an Oklahoma Thunder um, point guard. So he they just they just pulled him out of the Euroleague, and so of course Jokic. And then Canada did really well, but they did not have Wiggins and Jamal Murray. So I think it's going to be really interesting if both of those teams go uh, full strength. Well, and this to to round it out, this is why Germany wants Serbia in the EU because if they can, if a, if a country of eight million people can produce basketball players like that, just what kind of factory workers and engineers can they churn out if they have a little bit of uh, of German Excellent. discipline behind them? We, after all, we did uh, we did create the Yugo, uh, and if you don't know what a Yugo is, Google image search it. 
Well, I, I wouldn't Google image search anything Marco tells you to Google image search. All right, Marco, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk to you in a couple months, man. Thanks so much. Cheers. Awesome. Great talking to you. Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor.